Historia Canadiana is recorded on the unceded lands of the Kanyan Kaheka First Nation. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Historia Canadiana, the show where we talk about culture, politics, stories, and all kinds of fun, lovely things in this snowy land that we currently call Canada. Every once in a while, we like to have a guest on the show, and today we have a particularly special one, a Governor General's Award winner, no less, um, and I'm happy to have on the show Katharina Vermet, uh, author of A Girl Called Echo, a book that we are here to talk about, or the re-release of, that we are supposed to talk about. Welcome to the show. Uh, thank you, Marcy. Marcy, happy to be here. Um, do you speak French regularly, or...? Uh, no, I speak very bad French. I speak slightly better Machif. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but no, not at all. <laughs> so, so getting right into it, because we're uh, limited on time in this case, uh, can you start by describing what exactly A Girl Called Echo is as a book for those of us or our listeners who might not have an awareness of it? For sure, for sure. Um, a Girl Called Echo is a graphic novel series. Uh, the new Omnibus edition just out, which we are celebrating now, is four parts um, with some extra, you know, beautiful essays on either side of, of the graphic novel. Uh, the idea I had for A Girl Called Echo was really just a, a time traveling little book geek who finds herself just enraptured by this history of her people, the Métis, Métis, um, Machif people. Um, and she just finds herself, so she's so enraptured by these words and these books that she ends up getting transported back in time and gets to experience these things. Um, it's pure fantasy on my part as a self-proclaimed um, history and book nerd. Absolutely. And but that kind of brings up the next question is you openly admit that this is fantasy, but it is still profoundly rooted in the history of the Métis people in Canada. Um, and I'm wondering how you approached kind of balancing both very real elements and the inherently fantastical premise of traveling back in time, uh, in this case, through the power of imagination or will. <laughs> Exactly. It's true. It is very much rooted in realism. I was very painstaking in trying to get all my facts aligned, which is really hard for me to do because as much as I love the history, I'm also so frequently distracted by shiny things and very, very much a poet in the way I research things go off on these fancies. Um, but I did want to get the all of the everything right everything as correct as possible in history also the world that echo lives in in modern day and present day is also a very real world um and so both of them are very much not imaginative well they are imaginative are uh, but they're also like they're they're real but being able to go backwards and forwards through time um that was the fantasy and that was almost like i wanted to write it not that she has a time machine, not that there's some sort of sci scientific reasoning. It's almost as if she's just going back and forth in dreams, which is something we do in our imagination. So as fantastical as it is, it's very much real life. Absolutely. And I, while it is, like you were saying, fantastical, I do think it, it does point to something that we tend to overlook in history, although less and less, I feel, in the modern era is that history is a narrative in and of itself, right? And there are certain liberties that we take in telling certain histories, whether on how we represent a character or a person or an event with a certain viewpoint. And so the overlap in this case of narrative and history, factual as it may seem, right, is definitely present, regardless of whether it's fantasy based or not. So I think that's something that inherently this particular comic points to, um, and I find particularly interesting. Um, you mentioned briefly that you like to think more with a poet's eye and you have written poetry as well and other uh, in other mediums. And I'm wondering in this case, has or was the writing of a girl called Echo, a comic book influenced by your other uh, experiences in different mediums, uh, whether it's poetry or novels, anything like that? Um, For sure. I find that every time, every piece of work is a 
kind of requires its own medium and kind of calls to its own medium. It works best. Po poetry, poems work best in poetry. You know, stories work best mm -hmm. in prose, um, fiction, or whether it be fiction or nonfiction. Um, for Echo, it was my first graphic novel. I really plunged into the experience head first, not quite knowing what I was doing. Um, I started in poetry. I tend to start all my projects in poetry. It's just kind of a freewheeling way of of getting right to the point without all the, you know, nasty plots and technical things that you have to worry about. I, I write a very free verse, free loving kind of poem, poetry. So I started there and then not really knowing how to um, write a graphic novel. I wrote a script. I, I wrote a script for her and she really started as a script. I knew she was going to be a graphic novel, but also through the script realized that she's actually a very, very quiet person. Um, so needed to be that visual. And I really relied on Scott Henderson um, and Donovan Yusick, to, who was the colorist and the illustrator. Mm -hmm. um, and they really just brought her to life and brought the story to life because it is very much the, the script of Echo was very visual, just in like opening scene, girl in jean jacket and baggy cargo pants in the midst of a prairie sunset while bison come in. Like there's there's not a lot of words. There is very, um, the first few books, especially the dialogue only happens in the past or when she's very few times when she's in the present because it's really about her solitude in the present and then the community she finds. Um, yeah, so I really, I relied on those two forms heavily when I wrote and I think they really became really helped me get into knowing what I was doing because I didn't know what I was which is how I mo mostly do projects <laughs> I mean that's fine the number of times that I've heard of you know uh film directors or writers who just plunge into the thing and it makes some of the more interesting pieces of art just because without necessarily being beholden to the so-called rules of a medium you're much freer to do whatever you want with them right so mm -hmm. I think that's a very interesting perspective. <laughs> and I wanted to come back. I, this was a question I had planned for later, but since you brought up Scott Henderson and... But Donovan Yatsik is the colorist. Thank you. <laughs> so you you kind of brought this up uh, as well. So the comic is mostly silent, uh, at least in the present parts. And, you know, what was it like working with an artist uh, like Scott Henderson to actually convey this were you did you give him a lot of freedom to kind of portray a lot of this or did you have a specific idea in mind as to how these particular panels which were mostly silent uh and people wouldn't necessarily have a thought of writing involved in this did you i want to i don't want to say micromanage in this case but were you more involved in those or did you uh kind of let henderson do his own thing in the silent um i definitely wasn't a micromanager i hope I yeah. hope not. Okay. Um, I very much like it. It's it was very much like the relationship you have in film because it, in film, um, you're you're reliant on other people's expertise and you're really just um, in writing and directing. Which I felt very much that I was kind of writing and directing this graphic novel. It becomes this. These are my ideas. And then these magnificent, talented folks make them happen. And that was Scott. I had I had big ideas. We were very, we had lots of conversations as far as character development and what each of the characters were going to look like. We looked at the settings in a very um, big way as far as like I was telling the opening scene of the bison hunt coming toward this young modern day kind of kid um, versus uh, how we shot how we shot, how, how the, uh, um, the modern day pieces were styled and how the past mm -hmm. were styled. Um, we had lots of big ideas and, and Scott really just filled in all of the blanks there. You know, there were so many elements of graphic novels that I didn't even consider, like as far as um, what each page looks like, how many things you can put on a page, how many, how much, how you can cluster certain scenes, how you have to spread other parts out. Um, I really relied on his knowledge. He had done, I don't know, dozens of books at this point, um, dozens more since. Um, so really he, he walked me through a lot of that and we did four of them and we paced them out a year each. So originally Echoes volume one through four was over four years. 
Um, I did that in order to get all the history research done, in order to get these nice, beautiful scripts together for Scott. Um, and then he could draw them and, and we could produce them that way. And I really feel that by the fourth book, we had it down. We had a good system. <laughs> We worked out all the kinks in our process, um, just in time to be done. <laughs> and um, you know, coming back to this idea of balancing, right, which is, that was you, we already brought up a little bit. You know, you're balancing history, but also the current situation of Métis and uh, or Métis people in in this case Winnipeg. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, can you speak a little bit about your process of you know, striking that balance between, you know, a historical moment while still addressing how these have impacts in the present moment, because, you know, history tends to do that uh, generally. Yeah, history kind of doesn't seem to end, does it? It just kind of keeps going and going as if we're living in it at this very moment. Mm -hmm. um, I I was very conscious of that really early on. I did want to um, I did want to have four volumes. I didn't want to end at 1885. So often, um, Mitchiff history, for those who are familiar, is really centered on the three um, insurrections, being the Pemmican War, the Red River Resistance, and the Northwest Resistance, and which happened in 1885, the last one there, the uh, which also ended with the um, execution of Louis Riel. So after that, there always seems to be this stop in Métis history, Michif history, as if, you know, we've done nothing since then, you know, this yeah. long, you know, hundred and however many years, 40 years uh, since then, um, where so much has happened. I really want to make sure to have that last volume. And, and I need, I probably should have had many more than one volume to kind of cover that and make that connection because the experience that Echo has in present day from the very first is, is she's in, she's experiencing those intergenerational effects. And when we talk about intergenerational effects, we're not talking about, you know, we're talking about something that has lived in our bones and our blood and our memory and our country and our land for generations. There is no disconnect between when we start the story in 1816 versus when, you know, Echo's modern day, which was probably about, when did I write it? 2016. 2000. Two yeah. Yeah, I think it was 2006. I think it was around the, the 200th anniversary of the seven, um, uh, Battle of Seven Oaks um, when I started, when it was published. So it's, it is this direct link and it's not always obvious, but the my hope was through the course of the four volumes that we learn just how, um, not how much is lost and how much that echoes experience and those intergenerational effects we see in present day is still the experience of that loss because so much was taken away. Absolutely. And you demonstrate that I feel in the book as well between uh, in the way that uh, echo learns history, right? Mm -hmm. uh, she learns history in the classroom and it's a very, I don't want to say, well, I guess you could say formulaic or typical way of learning history, right? Or what you'd expect uh, from a conventional key in university, uh, school, sorry. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the difference between that and lived history, which is completely different. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought that was a very interesting way of uh, representing it because what the teacher is talking about, yes, indicates a certain aspect of history, but also, as you're saying, stops at very key moments that doesn't necessarily get to the heart of how these kind of uh, histories are, as you say, intergenerational or have an ongoing impact on uh, various communities, right, including the Métis. Yeah. Um, so I just thought that was a very interesting uh, oh, thank point. You. I do want to pay homage to to the teachers. I think teachers do a valuable service. And I think, obviously, that seems like, you know, a very underwhelming way to say teachers are awesome. And the work that they do is absolutely integral to, to all of us. Um, and, you know, the most important things teachers have taught me to do is to think critically and to point me in the direction of books so that I can to continue my knowledge and I can continue to develop that. Um, one of the things I found fascinating about this project and when I dove into this idea of actual he researching history, just not for my my own thing, but for a book, so it had to be correct, right, was the way that history moves so much depending on the teller, depending on the time, depending on the context. So when Mr. B is in the classroom, 
telling these paragraphs of the Battle of Seven Oaks and the and what led to the Pemmican Wars, it's very true. It's very factually true. But those paragraphs are very stale and not really attached to anything. But then you turn about and Echo slips back in time, of course, because the magic of time travel, she's in those moments. And those are real life people doing real life things in real life circumstances. And it they're both the same, but it one it just breathes life into this idea of of this history and and even though something can be factually true it can also leave out so much of the truth absolutely and i like that you brought up the idea of thinking critically about history or art because each of these volumes or each of the sections of the volumes as you were saying before either starts or ends with a bit of history uh whether it's uh explicatory sections or uh more critical um, more critical works, right? And I really enjoyed the one by Brenda McDougall, in this case, the section uh, by her, because she brings up a really interesting term that I'm curious to hear some of your thoughts about, which is the idea of kinscapes. Mm -hmm. um, so can you tell listeners a little bit more about uh, how McDougall uses that particular term and why it's important to this particular work? Because I think it relates to what we've been talking about so far. Mm -hmm. Um. Well, Brenda McDougall is one of our foremost, she's literally the Métis chair uh, or the Canada research chair in Métis studies and history. So um, whatever I bring to it is nothing compared to what she can bring to it. So I can only talk about why understanding of kinship spaces or sure. um, Wakotawin, which is um, the Cree word or Machif word for kinship. And mm -hmm. this it's the idea of, as I understand it, um, not a fluidity, but kind of like that are, but also a fluidity, but an openness to nation states and nation lines. So as Machif people in West, in what is now Western Canada, we are also incredibly connected to the Inanu people and the Neho mm -hmm. and the um, Anishinaabe people, um, Dakota people in, in many respects. Um, so as much as we are our own nation, we're also connected to all these other nations. And I think um, though it is a very based in Indigenous history as in Indigenous knowledges, that idea, concept can also extend to our European relatives. Um, I, I think Machif people have a very, um, have a, a kinship, a Waco to win uh, with Quebec folk, um, you know, in that we have those French lines and many of us in, in Machif country do have ancestors who came from Quebec and came over um, side of things. Um, to then go on and, you know, help form the Mitchiff nation. Um, so I feel kinship there. Um, in this, in the context of this story, that idea of kinship extends over the decades and over the generations. So Echo is literally going back and connecting with her ancestors and hanging out and experiencing community with them because she gets to be a time traveler because she's very lucky. Um, but also you know, her story is very much interwoven with their story. So there's always that, um, those webbings between. So we're not, we're just like, we're not as individuals all by ourselves and, you know, islands and silos out in the world. We're always interconnected. In Absolutely. And it points to this divide that we've been pointing to throughout of official history versus lived history that, you know, if you look at the official history, there's very clear borders and lines okay well this is where quebec ends and ontario begins and this is where canada is and blah 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 but you know that completely erases or glosses over a very fluid type of relationship that would have been seen you know prior to the establishment of canada as we know it today and continues to kind of go against these official borders even to this very day and as you were saying uh, affective or historic trans historical ways so i think that's a very important point to bring up which is why i wanted to mention it but yeah sorry would you want to say something uh, to that or oh no i was just thinking about the land because i didn't mention the land mm -hmm. and how, how the land is so fluid in this idea of kinship and one of our most important uh wakotoin is with the land and and land spaces that's a that that's a brilliant metaphor of of how the way you say it as as our modern borders are really such 
they're more an idea than actual commonplace. You know, Quebec doesn't end right at that line and Ontario begins. But yes, technically it does. But no, it doesn't. We kind of go back and forth over borders all the time. In Indigenous spaces, if you look on maps of Indigenous nations and where territories reside, um, it, it always tr goes over all of those made up borders you know manitoba saskatchewan and alberta are great examples of just land where lines were arbitrarily and very straight unnaturally straightly drawn um and of course the 49th parallel is the biggest example we in this part of the world um those of us who live close to the border with the u.s so many of our our histories and our ancestors and our people had no concept of that border and that border really intruded on so many lives and and people and livelihood and and everything else that came around when the border was imposed upon this territory Machif territory extends into northwest ontario across the three prairie provinces a little bit in bc all across the northern kind of united states um, lines that don't really, you know, lines that get interrupted in almost, in real violent ways when when they were imposed. And you know, the Métis people, correct me my history if I'm wrong here, but as far as I know, we're known for you know moving from one space to another, sometimes deliberately and sometimes not so deliberately, as settler colonialists kind of push uh, various peoples westward right or northern word but this idea of again of boundary pushing is you know present in the very history of um of, of these peoples so very yeah. uh very important yeah so i want to talk a little bit we've been talking a lot about everything surrounding the comic i want to focus a little bit on the character of echo uh herself and you brought this up already uh but i want to delve a little bit more deeply into it about the fact that she's not a character who speaks much. Um, so can you tell us a little bit more about why you thought it was important to make it so that Echo was not, despite her name, right, someone who uh, vocalized a lot of her thoughts or feelings and how that kind of uh, reflects uh, the themes of the book? Well, there's there, there's so many things that went into Echo and mm -hmm. literally the design of her was... Uh, Echo was created when my my two daughters, um, who are now in university, were teenagers. I also had a foster kid. I also had nieces, all in this kind of age, this very incredibly difficult age group of being a teenager and that coming into your, you know, your critical thinking and kind of coming into literally making your identity and who you are, which is such a difficult task. Um, and so many of us and our are quiet in that, you know, my kids are quiet. I was a very quiet kid. I wanted to really make Echo in their image, but also, you know, my image, you know, Echo really likes the nineties music because I wasn't going to give any reference to current music because I would have no yeah. clue what that was. So Echo became in love with her mom's playlist because it's my playlist and the playlist became its own theme that Scott and I had way too much fun with. Um, he is also a nineties kid. Um, but it was really this, yeah, this ode to the introverted kid, ode to the quiet kid, ode to the kid that knows all the answers, but never puts their hand up, you know, ode to those kids that just don't feel like they found their people yet, you know, and they're quiet and they're awkward and they're just so sometimes so sad and just looking for something, you know, I really wanted to examine that the power in that and through echo echo is incredibly powerful echo is incredibly knowledgeable uh she just doesn't know it yet you know and her name i fell in love with her name because i thought of it as um maybe she's quiet but in quiet and, and i think quiet kids are also i and this are also listening they're listening a great deal you know and i always say like half the time when a quiet kid has their headphones on you know sometimes their headphones aren't even on it's just a way to ward off people right I still do this at airports all the time um but it's they're listening all the time and they're observant of every little thing so I think echo was very much you know she was that echo of the voice of her ancestors you know and I think in a way she was always listening to her ancestors and her ancestors in many ways get to speak through her and you know and continue as they continue on as all of our ancestors go on through our, our ourselves 
thank you. That was beautifully put. Um, and you, um, you, you kind of may allude to the the mix of influences in Echo, uh, in both you know adult interests, as you were saying, the music, but also obviously you want to represent an accurate teenager, right? Yeah. Uh, who's kind of disaffected with a lot of things, uh, rightfully so in this case. And I'm curious, did you have a particular audience in mind with this particular book? Because, you know, comics have historically been viewed as a children's medium or more for teenagers, but you also bring up some quite heavy themes or themes that I feel adults would find better attraction to or more interest in, I should say. Um, and, you know, in the construction of the characters, as you were mentioning, you also have all kinds of mixes like this. So did you have a particular audience in mind or were you trying to make it accessible for all kinds of different people and a book that can be returned to at different ages? Hmm. I like the idea of, I always like the idea of books that can be returned to at different ages. Cause I know I like my favorite books. I like returning to them in different eras and realizing I'm seeing completely different things. So that, that I'd be honored if someone did that. Um, for, for Echo, we very much wanted to write, uh, something, um, educational, but I say educational in quotation marks. Mm -hmm because I always like to shy away from being explicitly educational or ed awareness building and all of that. You know, my important, my goal as a storyteller is to tell a story. If a story's good, like all stories educate and bring awareness of, of whatever they're talking about. Um, but a story needs to be a story first and foremost and last. Um, but also because we are dealing with history and real facts and history and, and timelines and such, I did want to get that correct. And also, um, it does lined up, line up with a lot of history curriculums and depending on different age groups here in Manitoba where um, we have a lot of Michif history in different age, I believe it's grade eight and grade nine, um, different points. So I did want to um, connect with those learning goals if and when possible. Um, also a lot of, um, this has also been used in universities. So of course, um, also any kind of Michif history, indigenous history class in universities, it also hits with that. Um, I made Echo, Echo is a shorty. She's, well, she's shorter than everyone, but I, I picture her, I think is a middle year student and she's graduating middle years at the end of the, but then looking at her, she also looks like, and looking at Micah, her friend and her school, it could also very just as easily be a high school. Um, it's really just about that teenage identity building and identity finding, community finding, um, which can happen in middle school if you're lucky, in high school if you're equally lucky, in university, never, whenever it happened. Um, I'm almost so 30 it, and it hasn't happened yet. So, you know. But I seem to always find community. And then I, again, poet mind, get distracted by other things and go off and suddenly it's just me and my dog again. What happened? <laughs> <laughs> so you know it it's fluid right but I did like I all this to say I never have an idea of audience for my stuff I mean I really speak to I write for myself in the story I want to hear and I write for people who I'm writing about which tend to be my people either my communities or um you know um, my communities are my home space. I kind of tend to always write around a concept of Winnipeg, even when I don't call it Winnipeg. Um, yeah. I'm very much kind of here um, and think place is so abundant to and and so much a part of who we are, who where we live is so much a part of who we are and what we do, like literally what we do. Um, so I, I do want to speak to that, but at the same, so I want to speak to people like me in the way that, um, I need to be authentic and I need to be true to them. I cannot misrepresent them. Um, and I want them to feel seen in what I do. So if for echo, I'm speaking to the introverted powerhouse kids, you know, the ones who sit at the back of the class, who know all the answers, but never raise their hand, you know, who hand in these pa pa essay papers to their teachers and just blow their teachers' minds because their teacher had no idea. Um, those kids. Um, but also, I think she's, you know, that doesn't exclude people who aren't like that, you know? Uh Last question that I have for you, Case. So you've mentioned that this 
not in the omnibus specifically, but basically it's in four parts, right? Or four volumes. Um, and is there a particular volume or section that you would consider your favorite or the one that speaks to you the most, either as a writer or someone who looks back on this project uh, with any kind of fondness? Um, when I started the project, oh, that's like, okay, this is going to be a very round question because I can't speak to anyone as my favorite. I learned so much with this. Um, when I started, I thought it would be all the Red River resistance. I thought I was like stampeding mm. through everything to get to 1869 because that's when all the fun happened. And it's true. If you know anything about Mitch of history, that's when the fun happens. Um, but I really, <laughs> in the, it's, but when in that, I was blown away by the Pemmican Wars. The Pemmican Wars was 1812 to like 1817. And it was actually the most difficult to write because it had the less amount of resources and um, lived experience stories. The other, the resistances in 1869 and 1885 were quite well documented as far as experiential um, storytelling through the people that actually lived with them, which I relied on heavily. Um, but there wasn't so much of that in 1812 to 1817. So it was a lot of sifting through really, really racist. There's no other way to say it. You know, you go through any kind of history in this country, um, any kind of indigenous histories, especially, and you have to wade through a whole bunch of rhetoric that is really unnerving um, to get to the good stuff, to get to those facts and things. Um, I was blown away by discovering Pierre Farcon, Pierre Farcon um, Cuthbert Grant, all of these amazing folks. Um, so the Pemmican Wars really surprised me. And I was equally surprised with um, volume four, which became known as the Red Road Allowance Era. Um, when I started this project, I didn't know what I was going to be focusing on in that era. I just knew that I didn't want to end with 1885. I wanted to keep going and make those connections. Um, and it was just perfectly timed because there was a whole bunch of research and academic work that was happening around road allowance at the time. So I got to connect with a lot of amazing stories and a lot of amazing artwork that was happening through that. Um, and again, my mind was blown right open to things that I thought I knew but didn't know. And um, yeah, history is kind of great like that. Just when you think you're overwhelmed with all of this evidence, there's even more evidence behind that so lots Absolutely. of gems lots of gems in this stuff Definitely. well thank you very much for all of your answers so far and i know you got to leave soon but there's one question hello dog there's hello. one question that i ask all of the guests that i have on the show and that was not sent to the guests but what didn't i ask in this interview and what's the answer to that question oh gosh um I tend to very much look at interviews as whatever conversation comes up. So I feel like, you know, I can't think of anything to add. I mean, um, I mean, it is a Historica Canada podcast. So I think I'm, I'm pretty speaking to my audience when I talk about the amazing history of this, these many countries and many communities and many nations that make up what is now called Canada. Um, there's so many things to learn and I'm I'm just really grateful for all the podcasts out there that have actually taught me so much um, about how history moves. It moves so much. What we think we know is nothing compared to what there is to know about any given thing at any point. I find it amazing. So I'm very Absolutely. excited. So thank you for having me. <laughs> it was truly a pleasure and I highly recommend to any listeners to uh, pick up the new omnibus edition of A Girl Called Echo. I assume it's available in all bookstores um, at this point. It, it will be on October 3rd, 2023. Uh, we did put off the release date just because of, um, I don't even know, bureaucracy probably. That's always the reason, right? Um, so October October 3rd, 2023, election day here in Canada, or here in Manitoba, not Canada, Manitoba in Canada. Um, it's a Tuesday. It'll, it should be available everywhere at that point. Right around truth and reconciliation day. So that's always good as yeah, well. To, yeah, we're landed pretty well. You know, we should, you know, fingers crossed, have our first indigenous premier here in Manitoba at that day. Um, oh, lovely. So, you know, very, um, all around good times around that day. And then the echo book icing on the cake. <laughs> of course. 
Uh, well, again, thank you very much and all the best in any subsequent project that is coming through. I always look forward to reading uh, your stuff. All right. Thank you very much. I'm honored. Marcy. Right.